let's say, fifteen years from now, Microsoft buys them, right? Well, and they then, did already. What? You didn't know that? ID is Microsoft. Yeah. What? No. That was uh, that was a couple. Uh, that was like a month ago. So Am the I being, software was. I can't. I can't tell if I'm being trolled. Oh my god. Venomous You're telling the truth. Microsoft, Disney, the RIA, ACE, John Gormley here in Saskatchewan, and other corporate media. And today I have a special guest from the Fediverse. Dylan, are you still with us? I am still with us. This makes me want an intro for my show. That was fucking cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we, uh, am I allowed to swear? I'm not sure. You are totally allowed to swear on this show. I will just You're have to mark it as uh, not safe for work when it goes to bit shoot. But uh, yeah, so maybe we'll talk later after the show and we'll see if we can find a... Uh, an intro for you. But uh, so as you mentioned, you have your own show. So before we get too deep into the show, what is your show and what is it all about? All right. So let me explain. I got some explaining to do. So I, like you said, my, my username everywhere is Dylan, but everybody calls me Dylan conveniently. Also my real name. Uh, I have a show, a podcast of sorts uh, called the Mel and Nancy podcast. Mel and Nancy, like necromancy, but with watermelons. It's a fucking long story. Story is already told on that show if you're interested. But uh, I met you, Jeff, on The Fediverse, which uh, you explained in one of your previous episodes. And I probably don't need to explain again, but uh, TLDR, it's like Twitter, but email. Yes, go back to that episode and listen to The Moon Man Show, which, by the way, where are you, Moon Man? We miss you. We want you on the show. Come join us. But yeah, so you have your podcast. And for the listeners who don't follow you already on The Fediverse, who is Dylan? And what can we know about you? Let's start with that. Let's see. What I will allow you to know is that I am a debt slave in the technology industry in my late 20s. Uh, I'll be 30 very soon. <laughs> I, uh, my, my show, the No Man's Podcast, is uh, it's about mostly video games, tabletop. It's really just uh, a couple guys talking. And the subject is always changing. And so when the the big companies like Microsoft come with money in hand, but the suitcase full of cash to your house or apartment or whatever, basically saying, oh, we like your podcast. Would you be willing to take our money and like huck our ideas and promote <laughs> our games, etc.? Or will you take their suitcase full of cash to pay off your debt, etc.? I tell you it's tempting because life as a debt slave is hard. Right. I probably wouldn't do it because I'm already pretty gainfully employed by somebody else, not Microsoft. And uh, I'm making headway on my debts. So I'd rather be independent from this whole podcasting business. It's totally a hobby for me, right? I don't even have a donations page up. I was thinking, and I mentioned this in my most recent episode that released yesterday, actually, that I'm probably going to make an OnlyFans. Not for porn, but like, because OnlyFans is a generic website that allows you to lock content behind a paywall. 
right? Right. So I was thinking about using it because Patreon's just kind of in the shitter these days, I hear. I don't have one of those either. And, uh, okay, so for OnlyFans, <laughs> now, I don't know if, how much <laughs> how much of this answer you can give, but, okay, so, like, I, as one of the members of the older generation, I see OnlyFans as this, like, either for strippers or young, attractive girls to find older gentlemen to pay them money to basically exist as beautiful objects of their sexual desire. Now, for in your case, it's using it kind of like as a paywall for your content. I mean, do you know of anyone else who's doing this as well? Of the, like, women in your cohort, uh, uh -huh. given you're a little bit younger, what percentage of them have OnlyFans accounts, would you say? So, I tell you what, I, I currently don't have my own OnlyFans account, and I don't subscribe to anyone. The word you're thinking of, by the way, is called simp. I'm not sure what it's short for. It's not short for simpleton, uh, but it is kind of like a white knight, but with a monetary uh, investment. These are people who will donate large sums of money, pretty much all their dispendable income, if it even is dispendable, to basically pay these girls to exist and they don't get anything in return. Or if they do, they just get access to paywall content. And also I describe it as paywall. Like I probably wouldn't actually paywall anything. It would just be like, hey, donate, right? yeah. like a tip jar. That's what Patreon was originally supposed to be. Well, and PayPal before it, right? It's a convenient yeah. thing that everyone is kind of assumed to have access to. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, especially if you're a young, attractive girl, like there, why not, right? It's, it's There's just free money sitting on the table. Table. So a lot of them do have access to it. So there's a lot of potential for you to be able to just use it as a payment layer, right? With, that you right. Can take for granted that it's just like in the background. A lot of people won't talk about it, but it's there, right? And there's a lot of people who make an entire living on OnlyFans. Yeah. And it's kind of, I don't want to use the word sad. I mean, it's valid, I guess, work, right? Like, I'm sure they work hard. Like, uh, but... What's weird is that, um, like, I have this thing I do on Fridays where I post, like, a bunch of, like, videos of people dancing, and I spell out FridayNight.com. Not a website I own, but it's, like, it's like an old YTMND page where it just it plays Slam Jam and has, like, a stupid picture. And it's like, yeah. yeah, Friday night. Right? I've been doing it every other week for a while now. And uh, one thing I noticed is, like, so I signed up for, for TikTok so I can get more videos to post specifically, right? right. And, so, and these videos are really short ones. Basically the same mm -hmm. kind you would see on TikTok anyway, but exactly fun, happy dancing videos, that sort of thing. Exactly. So I just wanted to find it, it seemed to be the best place to get fresh dancing videos rather because a lot of the places I was going to find like new, like happy, high energy dance videos that I normally post in those threads were just people who were scraping TikTok already and reposting it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, let's just go to the source. How bad can it be? And I find out that TikTok has a dark side where there's all these girls who are just there to shill for their OnlyFans page. They can't spell on TikTok without getting banned, by the way. So they, like, will say, check my links, check out my zero F page, right? Like, try to hide it and, and not... Like, and, and these are, like, human being girls, not, like, a bot yeah. posting it on a hundred different accounts or something. It's I like... have run into some of those, but they're okay. a lot more rare than actual girls just like this is their business and this is what they do right and they'll post risque content on tiktok that gets taken down by tiktok or they remove themselves before the censors can find them and flag their account like i've seen like not, not like full-on porn but i've seen like people who are dancing and really revealing clothing that is against the tiktok uh, community standards right okay. it's called thirst trapping right and they'll do it because they want people to see it in there with the algorithms that is shoving stuff in their faces like hey i don't know who this is also she's got a nice ass let's hit the follow button check yeah. out the rest of her profile ah oh, there's more but the older stuff isn't as risque because the ones the, the ones that she keeps up are not as bannable on tiktok and then like it, they won't link to the only fans page they'll link to their instagram or they'll link to like a, an aggregate like allmylinks.com or some shit like or link tree and in there they will have the only fans link Okay. And so there's like this pipeline of sorts of young girls, like between the ages of like, I think 18 and 25, right? So like younger than me, hmm. but not necessarily like, you know, the, there's older women as well doing this. There's right. just not as many. A lot of these girls are like 19, yeah. right? Or they're saying that they're 19 and they might not be. Yeah, exactly. And they're just like, yeah, so try my OnlyFans. I got stuff on there. Who wants to see me get railed on OnlyFans? And it's like, I mean... You're probably getting a lot of money from this. I really hope you do your taxes because you're going to get F by the FBI if you... Uh, well, see, that that's the one thing with Canada. I'm not sure if it's as true in the States where, like, recently our government gave out kind of free money. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than the free money, but it's like, as a COVID, let's not have the economy just collapse on itself. People who need money can get money, etc. 
there are more details than that, but long story short, there's like millions of Canadians that have a source of income now that are not used to paying taxes on that income, that there's going to be taxes on that income. And the tax situation for a significant chunk of Canadians got more complicated. And for another significant chunk of Canadians, it's like they now have to pay taxes and maybe they aren't going to file. Maybe they're going to... Revenue Canada is going to be very, very busy in a way they have never been in Canadian history. Now, in the right. States, I heard there was, like, uh, money given out, like, a check or something uh, during the last show. I don't know. I haven't been following on that side. But is the IRS, like, do they have time to chase all these young girls? or They do. So, <laughs> it's a very big controversy that hit Twitter a year or two, maybe a year and a half ago. It was before COVID, right? Okay. Easy. I remember they called it the Thought Audit. Like, T-H-O-T, that hoe over there. Okay, was, yeah. Right, so... People call, it's a degrading way to refer to sex workers, basically, is right. to call them thoughts, right? That hoe over there. Okay. Uh, some of them embrace it, and they, they, they self-identify it, so it's kind of complicated. Yeah. But that hashtag was called, you know, hashtag thought, thought audit, and it was okay. a bunch of people on Twitter who went after these girls who were like, yeah, check out my TikTok, check out my OnlyFans, send me, buy me all the stuff on my Amazon wish list. It's public, here it is. Yeah. Because Amazon enables this as well, because I don't know if you are a frequent user of Amazon, the retail, retail business, business. Mm -hmm. but you can create an Amazon wish list that, that you can post online and people can see it. They know it's yours based on what you tell them. It can still be relatively anonymous. Mm -hmm. They can't find your address, but they can buy things for you and Amazon will sort out the addressing, right? Yeah. So you can give people stuff without knowing where they live. And so a lot of girls that post these lewd images on Twitter and have these lewd TikToks, maybe they're not collecting money, but they're collecting stuff. And that counts for tax purposes, right? Right. And so it was speculated on various internet websites that these girls may not be paying their full due in taxes. But obviously, some of them are, especially the ones that are super serious about it being like a personal brand and business, yeah. right? But these, you know, 18, 19 year olds that are just you know, looking for stimps to go buy them a PS5, not so much, right? Yeah. Like, there's girls on TikTok, they have this aesthetic, they call it the e-girl aesthetic. And they have, like, everything's pink. They have, like, the freaking, like, card capture Sakura, like, mat rug for their wheelie chairs, which are all from the same brand called Autoful or something. And they have, like, the cat ear headphones and everything's fucking pink. And there's, like, hundreds of these girls. It's not just one, right? And I didn't know this until I started trolling TikTok for videos to save off for my random Fetty Friday night threads, right? Yeah. And I feel like I've stumbled upon like a dark internet. I just accidentally muted myself, can you hear me? Yeah, you're still here. <laughs> okay, cool. I, I hit my space bar with my hand. <laughs> anyway. Um, it's like you, you've revealed the secret of the dark internet and all of a sudden silence. Just... I mean, it, don't get me wrong, it's surface web. It's just tech. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel like there's this like sex work pipeline, whether well, people have varying opinions of sex work, I don't really give a shit, right? Um, yeah. I don't even think they should necessarily be taxed, I think, like, personally. But there are people on the internet that are like, oh, this will be funny. Let's, like, call the IRS on them. Yeah. And I guess it had some pretty negative consequences for some girls that really were not reporting their taxes. Like, it's just donation money. You know, it's like having a sugar daddy, but without having to have sex with them. Right. And you know what? That's actually a good point in that that sort of relationship, that, like, sugar daddy, like, older established man with younger, not so established, beautiful woman, that has happened forever. Like, you can go back as far back as you want. The Babylonian, like, uh, high priests, you know, that has happened forever. And that sort of relationship isn't taxed, right? If you actually right. get into a relationship with a pretty girl, like, there is no tax man interfering with that relationship until you start talking about getting married and then making it official and then et cetera, et cetera, right? right? And so, like, that dynamic, it's like a new place for the IRS, et cetera, to get their talents into, right? Right, and then I don't even know if marriage is on the table for most of these people because I don't know if you're familiar with the Zoomers, right? You know, the generation after me yeah. as a millennial, right? The generation after me, the Zoomers, they're, they're all about like polygamous relationships and stuff like they I don't think they they even want to get married there are people that they want to live in these major cities like Seattle right. right like I live in the greater Seattle area but I don't live in Seattle people can't afford to live in Seattle if you live in Seattle you probably bought your property a long time ago right and it has appreciated over time whereas if you live in Seattle and you're renting you're probably like five people to a, a studio in Chinatown trying to get by right okay like I've been in one of those apartments before and it's they're very tiny and a lot of young people will willingly seek out a polygamous relationships so that they can get by on their rent. Because five people in a one bedroom, not a problem if you're all dating. 
right? True, true. And on top of that, like there's this kind of expectation of caring for each other that is a level below relationship, right? Like the person you're sleeping with, you probably want them to be on some level okay, right? At the very least, like there's one night stands and stuff like that too, but like it's a natural thing to like get into a situation where you care about the person that you're sleeping with. Right. And so everyone's kind of cultural shift among the young folks is the thing. And eh, it's it's not for me, but uh, it's interesting to see where we will go in the future with so many young people partaking in this sort of lifestyle because uh, not necessarily... You you mentioned a little bit before the show that you also have a connection to this like other side of the Washington and kind of area there on some level where like you understand a little bit closer to the rural side, right? Where there's a different culture to be had somewhere on that Mm -hmm. side. And one of my previous guests from your area too has kind of talked about this where like there is a different culture to be found on kind of the other side, maybe of the mountains, I don't know the geography locally, but whereas there's the people in the Seattle area, this like very populous, very densely packed, highly educated area. And then there's this other area. Now, is that value shared on that other area? Absolutely not. So let me break it down. So Washington State has a very interesting geography. Like we have this range of mountains that runs down the middle of the state. East of the mountains is a desert. West of the mountains is a very like wet and fertile land because rain clouds are too heavy to cross the mountains. They bump into them and drop their rain. It's called the rain shadow effect. That's the reason why Western Washington is like marshy and will have light all day raining, whereas on the East Coast, you might get like a really crazy thunderstorm in the last five minutes. Right. right. So light rain for like three days straight, not that weird here, really. So the problem is, is that when it's these rural areas, like where my parents are from down south on the border, my parents and I have a lot of extended family as well that were in an area called Kelso, and which is really close to another city called Longview. They're kind of like two halves in the same city. They're so close together. But they're on the Columbia River on the border of Washington and Oregon. They have like a bridge that crosses into the other state in town, right? And uh, it's pretty densely populated. Like it looks like a suburb, right? With how close together the houses are and most people own their houses or they rent. Kind of looks like any other city suburb, but they're not close to any city. I mean, the closest major city they're close to is actually Portland in Oregon, right? That's still quite a ways away driving. So but that's not, I would not call that the greater Portland area, right. whereas the greater Seattle area in Washington is. That is defined by you could reasonably commute there for work, but you don't live there. Okay. And that's such an area where I live. I was commuting to Seattle before COVID. Now I work from home and I probably will for a very long time because tech workers are going to be the last ones to go back. I'm a debt slave in the tech industry. Somebody joined us. Hey, a new challenger has appeared. Have we got... Oh my goodness. Have you ever had someone join mid-recording? Yeah, we've had this happen before. I think you're muted though, uh, new possible guest. (laughs) Oh, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. So welcome, Moon. Great. Sorry uh, about that. I was helping my neighbor. No problem. So for those who are listening, Moon has been on this show before. So you can check out that previous episode for a little bit more about Moon. But I guess we were just talking about the the urban-rural boundary in the Seattle context. But as far as Moon, how is it going, Moon? <laughs> oh, it's going great. It's been a good day so far. This day is coming to a close. Nothing bad happened. I'm having a good time. How about you guys? Doing good. I um, have to my, my first beer and uh, just hanging out. Uh, first time using Jitsi Meet, the software. I'm actually kind of impressed at how, how Zoom-like it is, because uh, Zoom is kind of the standard these days, and obviously we're not going to use that. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've used it for a few different things, and it's been pretty nice. Yeah, I think I will host the server uh, for sure, because uh, this, is, this has been pretty good so far. Yeah, th- this server, by the way, is uh, run and operated by the Free Software Foundation, the very same that promotes GNU Linux around the world. For those of you interested in supporting such things, they are useful for, among other things, having a server that you can use and play with and stuff. But so, Dylan, continue on your story of the... Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. So what you missed, Moon, is we were talking about how... Well, for, well, Jeff introduced me and was like, yeah, I have a show as well. And I was like, yeah. And I was talking about making an OnlyFans so people could donate to the show because I don't have a means for people to donate. I mean, I'm only half joking because it's a serious platform. And the point I was trying to make was that OnlyFans is actually a legitimate business. It was not created to distribute porn. It's just used for that because it's convenient, right? And then we got on a tangent about Zoomers and polygamy, and it got weird. But that's fine. So <laughs> my point was is that people living in the cities, like a lot of them will adopt these new cultural values as a survival trait. 
right? Like people could live five people to a single bedroom apartment or a studio and they're all dating. It's not weird. There's only one bed. Better get used to it, right? And that's not too different than how some people who come to America for the first time had to probably live. They, they probably weren't fucking each other, right? But they were living in pretty desperate conditions. And the same is true of our youth, whether they were born here or not. And that's mostly because cities are shitholes and Seattle's no different. So south of the greater Seattle area, which I would border around Olympia, uh, if you're living south of Olympia, you probably can't reasonably commute to Seattle for a work day and, and make it home in a reasonable amount of time. Unless you like rent <laughs> a, a studio apartment in Chinatown, like I was describing. So like my parents are from rural South Washington. I mean, they were born out of state, they came here, right? They were born in even more rural conditions. And then their parents were from Norway, conveniently both. <laughs> what a coincidence. And then, so they spent most of their, their young adulthood and, and uh, teenage years in Southern Washington. And definitely the values are different. I think the youth as well don't adopt those values that I had just described. Like a lot of them are still looking for a more traditional American lifestyle. And they don't really necessarily have a path to home ownership, but they have an advantage that a lot of the city dwellers don't have in that most of them, the jobs available to them don't require a whole lot of education. And if they do, a lot of them could just go to trade school. Like I took a four year bachelor's degree in computer science and I'm still paying it off. I'll probably be paying it off today. I don't know. Maybe not. I mean, I am gainfully employed, so I, I probably will pay it off eventually. But I've got cousins that they make maybe half, maybe three fourths of what I make with no debt. And I'm just like, man, if I had no debt, I'd fucking rule the world right now with how much I make, right? Like I am gainfully employed, but I'm in so much crippling debt that it made it really difficult to buy this house that I'm in. Like I recently bought a house and put myself in even more debt, I know, right? But the dream is still alive and well. Like my father-in-law and his wife, they are like real estate agents. And they're, they're, like, they're like career real estate agents that have been doing it for a long, long time, right? And they're telling me about how tech workers uh, who all share similar values to all these rural people, right? They don't want to live in cities. Tech workers, when you imagine like a tech worker on the West Coast of the United States, you might think of somebody that's like, oh, he went to college and he probably wants to get like a high rise apartment or penthouse in downtown so they can walk to work and they can live in a coffee shop, right? That's kind of like- Young, never been professional. Are young, never been professional. That's like kind of the, that's the, the stereotype. But uh, I'm seeing anecdotal evidence of tech workers that they, they get a bunch of restricted stock units from a big company and they move companies every four years to like, keep milking them. They are gainfully employed from their experience. They've paid off their loans, probably from crypto shenanigans to help out. And they're looking to buy land very far from the greater Seattle area. We're talking like they want to become homeowners forever and they want to live far away from the city and live a more traditional life. Like, not necessarily like a cabin in the woods with fire internet. So, no, like, pausing for a minute here. Now, Moon, my internal idea of you is that you are is a little bit further out from the urban city situation. So how far along this fantasy are you currently at, out of curiosity, with your well, engram and millions? So, uh... <laughs> I live in Tucson, Arizona. We've got about 500,000 people, so it's not a small town. I live in an area that's kind of an older part of town, but I'm very, very close to my work. I, well, I, I did not grow up here. I grew up in the Midwest, so I very much am in tune with those, those values that Dan has been talking about. And if I could do it, I probably would go back to having kind of more of a, not necessarily rural, but Tucson is actually really good. It feels like a small town, even though it's bigger. So I kind of don't have, don't, don't have any problems here. But I would do it, like Diane was talking about. I would do that. Yeah, I'd give I, it I, I, I'm, Oh, just, I'm, I'm used to that. I'm used to telecommuting now, and I don't want to give that up. <laughs> yeah, same. Like, so Jeff, you've heard those memes that people post every once in a while, the return to monkey, and it's like monkey spelled wrong, right? It's, yeah. Like, talk about de-evolving. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure... Whoever came up with those memes and whoever's spreading that stuff, I'm pretty sure they're, they're thinking a rejection of where things are going because a lot of what is amplified on the internet is like the cultural shift happening in our cities. A lot of people in rural areas don't even have internet. I have relatives that just have dialogue because it's not available where they live. And I only see them on the holidays. And to them, the, the world around them has not changed. And they live just fine lives, completely fulfilled. And it kind of blows me away. Like, I think when I retire, if I have a choice, I think I would move to Alaska. Actually, <laughs> I have an aunt who lives in Alaska. She lives on an island called Unalaska, which is uh, on that chain of islands that kind of looks like a hook okay. underneath the mainland, right? And it's like in the middle, like it's not close to mainland at all. And uh, she lives in a place called Dutch Harbor. And uh, she owned the only coffee stand in town and imported like coffee bean from far away and introduced the entire town to the concept of caffeine when it was not previously. <laughs> it was kind of wild to think about. 
Because I take coffee for granted, you know? Like, there's a freaking Dutch Bros on every corner. That's not true. There's Starbucks on every corner. There's one Dutch Bros. It's better than all of them. But that's because in Washington State, Starbucks is the standard, and every coffee shop that's not Starbucks is, by default, better. Because if they weren't, they'd be out of business. Okay, interesting. So, like, on the monkey side, though, like, you're right, though, that there, there is this kind of, like, as soon as you move to these big, massive cities, and Toronto would be a good example of one, maybe the moon, your city as well, is probably big enough to see this. Saskatoon, where I am, is, like, just on the cusp of getting the size where, like, there starts to be serious costs, personal costs, to living in a city that large. And, like, you mentioned, like, that having five roommates to share basically one bed, like, we're not here at that point here in Saskatoon yet but like you can right. see it in the bigger cities where like the rent goes up and up and up and especially say like exhaust the available surface area <laughs> San Francisco like there are these problems that cities come up with and then to be the outsider to be on the, the rural mm-hmm. side where like you're only like, seeing little glimpses here and there of, especially like, through the media where it's like, exaggerated and like, shown to be darker and I had one person who was very very nearly a mother-in-law where they, were, they saw cities as being like the same thing as Babylon on in the biblical times where it was like anyone who lived in the city was like already subjected to the horror of Babylon and there is this vision of city life like that to walk away from and it's an old story like with Lot and the the original Old Testament like walking away from the this city that has gone wrong in some sense and yet a lot of people see this and then like try to go to the rural side but it's like it, there's things keeping that from happening too so on your side at Dime like you've got your anchor to your your property etc cetera, etc cetera, but like what kept you from going further rural why computer science and not like going into trades yourself for example right it was kind of a risk right so the area I live I'm not going to name the town I'm not looking to dox myself here, right. Brian, but I'm in the greater Seattle area and the town I'm living in is actually the town in which I was born, right? My parents do still live here. I do have two young children and I want them to be a big part of their lives. I remember my grandparents for both sides, both lived down in Kelso, which was two hours drive away with no traffic, right? So as soon as it was for a holiday, it's a three to four hour drive one day and it made us not visit them very often, right? Uh, whereas, you know, my mom works all the time and sees my two sons, and it's a great time for everybody. And I just don't want to leave, not until they're older, right? Like, I have to think about their childhood and the things that made my childhood good. I need to, like, do better. Because, I mean, I'm pretty happy with the childhood that I had, but I want to raise the bar. Of, you know, what am I doing, right? All right. So, speaking of things from your childhood, uh-huh. the one of the things that is kind of visible about you on the Fediverse is that you have this, like, Doom Caco Demon as your icon. And, uh, yeah. We were talking a little bit, joking around, going... So in 10, 15 years, like Microsoft's eventually going to buy ID software because Microsoft has this tendency of like gobbling up everything that is good and precious about the world that they can get. And so... And then I pointed out that it had already happened a couple months ago and it kind of blew your mind. Yeah. Because that was pretty funny. <laughs> so ID buying Microsoft, what do you think about that? So it's the other way around. But yeah, so what happened sorry, was Microsoft. is... Yeah, yeah. Its software was bought out by Bethesda, and Bethesda was bought out by ZeniMax. And then ZeniMax sold Bethesda to Microsoft, and that included all of the properties under Bethesda, not just Bethesda proper. So they got Skyrim, Elder Scrolls, what have you, right? They've got its software and its multiple property. It also include Doom, Wolfenstein, Rage, and Quake. I quite forget Quake. So, yeah, they haven't made any games with them since buying them. Like, Doom Eternal came out before this merger, right? But I don't know if you played Doom Eternal. It was fun. I liked it better than Doom 26. I think all Doom games are worth playing. But like, I, I think the last one that I played was Doom 2. So I'm a little out of the loop on that. But yeah. There's a reason people keep playing Doom 1 and Doom 2. is because John Carmack, one of the two Johns that kind of made Doom happen, the other one was John Romero, right? John Romero was the ideas guy that kind of made, gave it the soul, right? Whereas John Carmack was the technology guy, and, and he had this like 500 IQ moment where he open sourced Doom. So that's why there's mods that are really high quality that are still made today for Doom, the original, because it's completely open source. You have access to all the same tools that the devs that make the game had. And so people will make what is called a mega wad. Wad stands for where's all the data, WAD file. Those are the, like, so Doom, the game, Doom 1 and Doom 2 are just wad files for the Doom engine that you can go look at. Right, and they sold those WAD files. There and and these WAD files are basically the, the, the levels files, or the or the, free ones. the content for it, right? Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah. So people still make new wads today. And some of them are like, uh, in many ways, better than the original Doom and worth your time. And it's just wild. Like so, they can make new games all they want. No, one, they're not going to stop modding the original. So on Moonside, have you played any of these modded Doom wads? And yes. do you have any like favorite examples that are coming to mind? I'm not one of the hardcore people. I've done it. I played DZ Doom. I think it was. Or maybe just been Z Doom. But uh, yeah, there's like new people still coming out with new levels. And they had a lot of enhancements to it, like the graphics are better. Some of them have it where you can have, like, free look, so you can look up and down. Not that it matters that much, because, you know, you just kind of shoot in a straight bar. But uh, all kinds of enhancements and stuff. And, and, yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm one of those people that still plays the old games. I don't play any of that. Like, I play almost no new games. I played Doom Eternal. It was pretty good. Like, I was impressed with it. Which is good for me because usually anything new that comes out, I don't like it. But well, Eternal was pretty good. But I still play the old games. Oh, for sure. And so it's like, hard to beat. So it's hard to beat the old stuff. Like they're still good. Better. But it's impossible to overstate how amazing Doom was when it came out because you have to remember that these were like 486s with like 25 megahertz CPUs, and you're you're used to playing like 2D games or like console games, things like that. And then a thing comes out that's it's not really full 3D, but it looks like it is. Yeah, and no. yes, Wolfenstein was before Doom, but it yeah. wasn't that long before Doom, right? And yeah. it could, they almost hit me at the same time, especially being yeah. out in the rural area where, like, you don't have an internet connection. Everything's whereas and, like, traded floppy disks yeah. because that's the only way things get to you out there, right? The yeah. way that we got stuff where I lived, because I lived in a rural area, was that my brother was a credit card scammer. And yeah. then he got credit cards and then we buy, like, 20, the 100 AOL number to, like, get us on the internet. Well, that was how we got internet was through with AOL. Number. Which, by the way, yeah. for those of you interested in experiencing AOL, apparently they're still sending discs. I had no idea that this was still a thing, but yeah, you can apparently still get dial-up through AOL if you. And you know what? There's probably some old grandmas out there in like the the rural areas of the U.S. that don't understand that their cable comes with broadband, and they're probably still paying for AOL, thinking that's how I get internet. Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever told them to cancel is probably Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like, yeah, there's, there's no value proposition anymore because they, it used to be that they had their own ecosystem, and now they don't have their own ecosystem. They just do internet, which used to be an add-on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember it took your phone line because you plugged in those RJ12 phone cables into your modem or whatever, not the new hotness, the RJ45. <laughs> oh, I remember how bad it was. Like, you lived in a rural area, and we would try to dial up BBSs that were all long distance. And it was, I mean, that was like the 90s, you know, like the early 90s, like 91, 92. And you're trying to connect. And if you're talking to somebody on the phone, you could barely hear them, let alone data. So you're trying to like, you know, like in theory, this thing can do like 336K VOD. But in reality, if you actually just talked on the thing, you couldn't understand the person. So you're probably getting like, you know, like 12 or 8. <laughs> So speaking yeah. of old tech, though, so recently, Moon, you've been posting a couple of pictures of digging through what looks like a, a storage room or something, just finding old, old things. So what's the favorite thing that you found in digging around in this, wherever it is you were digging around? Oh, sure. So I had moved out, I had moved out here to Tucson um, in 2010 and left most of my stuff back in the Midwest. And my parents decided to move, and so they started getting rid of things. So they started, they started giving me boxes of stuff, and that's why the stuff started showing up. Uh, some of the stuff I thought had been lost forever. Uh, some of the things I had found was, the, you had said things that particularly I'm glad that I found was, I found all of my stuff from my uh, home state trip in Japan in 1993. So I found like toys, I found addresses of people, I found trinkets and photographs just a big cache of stuff and just looking through that stuff has been so great so uh, this, when you say homestay what exactly do you mean like you you went to japan I stayed with a, yeah i stayed with a japanese family for half a year when was this in 1993 oh okay uh, you were talking oh, about going to japan before covid and i was wondering if you actually went no that got shot in the butt that's not that's happening yeah, yeah. About 93 for about about half a year and you know i went to school and not only did school work even though you can't really if you don't speak the language there's not much you can do but uh, i got the full cultural experience so that was a, a very nice thing but i just had all this stuff on that trip and it was in a box and i hadn't seen the box in 20 years and then it sh showed up and now i've got all the stuff again what's one of the memories that's like come out of this box from that japan trip 
Oh, uh, some of the people, it's been so long that I've forgotten their names. But it's just being able to see the people and remember their names again and see faces. Just a bunch of photographs. It was 1993, so it was just a regular camera. The picture quality is terrible. But it just really brought back a lot of great experiences. Now, the funny thing is, is that the, the town that I stayed in, years later, had a massive earthquake and the town was basically demolished and what they decided to do then was it was during this period of time where japanese towns would like consolidate so the three closest towns consolidated and made a new town so the place that i had stayed and lived doesn't exist anymore it's like almost like and an alternative mentioned. history or something right where like yeah if that town that got, those memories don't exist they weren't real it was all fictional that, the towns have the an, another name I, I, it's like they say you can't go back i literally can't go back because the the place that i was at was demolished and then the town doesn't exist anymore it's a different town so it is so not there in either spirit or or, or physical presence it's like that movie Dark City. Like you look around, and everything's just like a little different. Like this isn't yeah. what I remember. This is this can't be right. <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, there's literally nowhere I could go where I would recognize if I went back. Speaking of this this idea of being recognized, though, right? Because like especially for those of us who who lived in the the 90s before the the advent of social media, like the the Fediverse, like Facebook, etc., where there's this like consistent identity that follows us as we go, whether or not it's as I have through my own name or through Dylan, uh, through this consistent uh, image or picture or something that people can grasp onto and keep over a long period of time, that, like, in, in this case, like, if you wanted to go back and visit with and track down some of these people, like, they're gone, right? Like, it's, it's, there's, there's been, like, a clean break. Now, as far as your experience for, I guess, the both of you, like, that boundary between the Internet fully connected and the, the parts of us that kind of stay from the previous time, do you have any experience with that other than... Yeah, that? so I think I know what you were asking. So, like, for example, when I was... Um, obviously, I'm a little younger, right? Like, <laughs> so when I was, like, a teenager... The PS2 was available, right? <laughs> Don't mean to make you feel old. But I, that was like back when online games were like, for consoles, were, were first accessible because you could plug in the phone cable to your console and, and do it like the PC gamers do, right? That was kind of like a new thing for console gaming, which made it accessible before. Because you know, more people like me, we, we, I had a PS2. I didn't have a PC, right? I didn't own a computer until I was like 17, right? So I was able to play some games online, and I remember a friend of mine, actually the co-host of my podcast, his name is Sarge, right? We were friends, and we lived near each other. He had a computer, and so, and a PS2. He had a little bit more than I did, right? But we were both poor as shit. So I remember, like, we would play a lot of Metal Gear Online, which is a the online component to the third Metal Gear Solid game, which uh, a lot of people don't remember because it was, like, the special edition when they added this thing. Because that was back before you could update video games with a freaking download, right? Like, they had to release a whole new version, and it usually wasn't full price if they had, like, a definitive version of a game. And so with the definitive version of Metal Gear Solid 3, they added an online multiplayer. And we played a lot of it. It's shut down now. You had to jump through a bunch of hoops to play it today. But I remember the online community. Like, I used to think, you know, back in the day, your parents would tell you, don't use your real name on the Internet. You know, everything on the Internet stays. It's forever. Don't say something stupid. Uh, I don't know where that logic went with, you know, Facebook. I mean, what, those old people don't believe in their own words, clearly. But I participated in an online forum called Game Battles. It's a stupid name. They got bought out by MLG, uh, which is actually a company, by the way. So that, that and, company hasn't been bought by Microsoft yet, right? Right. I mean, maybe they are. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> they got paid over. Like, I remember, like, we had a, a forum. It was an uh, old BB... I forget the software, it was, but it used BB code, so I'm guessing it was some VBB-based forum software on GameBattles.net where we could discuss Metal Gear Online and matchmake with their stupid leaderboard thing, right? And I wasn't in like a very competitive team. I mostly just like started shit and made fun of people, <laughs> right? I was just a disruptive force in their community. They probably didn't like me too much, but it was a lot of fun, and I made a lot of friends. And when the day Metal Gear Online shut down, the, the admin of that board that worked for GameBattles.net, like, he hated Metal Gear Online. He didn't play it himself, and he was just a steward of the board. And as soon as the game shut down, they paved over that forum, deleted everything, and it's gone forever. And you know, there's a lot of really good threads and a lot of memories that uh, I wish I could go back and look at, but it's gone. And then I, I don't think anyone archived it. I don't know if archival was a big thing 
back in 2000, whatever this was. Yeah. 2004, three, I don't know. A, s- a but, simpler uh, time right with over. fewer people with WGET just going all the time. So like, I'm, I'm sad that it's gone and I'd love to go back and go over those memories. I remember um, every once in a while, I'll do like a bit of an OPSEC cleanup where I'll log into a lot of my old accounts that I don't use and just delete stuff if they let me, right? And I remember I logged into my MySpace account. <laughs> this was in like 2018, right? Yeah. And uh, this was before they lost all that data because MySpace somewhat recent breach of data where they lost fucking everything. Hmm. Um, Especially music, yeah. which by the way, if you have any MySpace music saved from the, the before 28 period, get in touch with either me or the Internet Archive because people are interested in that stuff. But anyway, continue. Oh, yeah. All those MySpace bands that never made it big, but they posted and they had good stuff. Yeah. <sighs> Missed some of them. But yeah, like I logged into my MySpace account and I looked at my private messages and a really good friend of mine from high school, like the subject of our back and forth mail thread was, I hope you die in a fire. Because <laughs> I, we would say shit like that to each other. And like if somebody like got a hold of that, they'd probably like try to cancel me or something like, oh my God, <laughs> Dylan doesn't like Filipinos. It's like, no, that's just how we talk to each other, dude. Like... <laughs> We thought it was funny. Like, we saw each other every day. It's kind of mentioned in the last show, like, there's a difference between what people will say to each other in private with the intent of having them understand what is being said versus what you would say in public with the intent of, like, having it be the truth, right? Because mm-hmm. if you say something in public, there's this kind of level of accountability to it right. and that you can basically be judged for it in a way that like, only one person is judging you in a private conversation, right? Right. And so, and- so you, you can say crazy shit to each other and nobody's going to like, you know, throw you under the bus for it. Right. right. As long as you're yeah. mindful of what that other person will judge you for. Right. And that right. only way to figure that out is by communicating, finding out where their boundaries are, etc. Yeah. This dude was like one of my best friends in high school. And you know, we would say an ain't shit to each other all the time. And, but it was never like, mean. Like we laughed. It was funny. We would send it to each other in the same room. Like he'll be on the Nintendo Wii, type it up a storm on MySpace Mobile, and I'll be like on my PlayStation Portable on the Wi-Fi uh, at like one megabit speed or whatever the fuck it was. Like, <laughs> so it was funny. <laughs> so back to Moon though. So in terms of this Japan trip and like connecting to that previous time, that previous part of perhaps yourself do you anticipate you'll be able to track anyone down or like is, is it more of like a call out of this is the people who i could connect back with uh, or is it just like totally lost forever or it was reestablishing the memories because i'm never going to see any of these people again there's almost no reason to go back and try to look them up again you okay. know you, you had a fleeting moment of time where you where you talked with them and now at this point like with, with my age we're adults they're married, they have families, they're not that fifteen year old girl that I knew yeah. anymore. And I was and I was just a temporary period in their life. It probably was maybe forgotten pretty quickly. Definitely forgotten by now. Yeah. So uh, reconnecting, re- it's it's really wonderful to go back and see all those things, but, but reconnecting just probably won't happen. Also in terms of the difference in culture between Japanese culture as you experience it and like the American culture that you're kind of used to, is there anything that kind of sticks out that that you kind of saw or experienced during that trip now that you're going through these memories again? So the thing about it was, is I went when I was young and I was at, you know, at school and there was other young people. Everybody is kind of rolling out the red carpet for you. So it's not necessarily the most representative experience that you're having. You're having an idealized experience. And one of the things that I can tell you about is that you have people that, that write on forums or, or on Twitter, like, oh, you weebs, you basically like, like putting, putting them down, like, like you, Japan is not like what you think it is. It's not this idealized place that, that you're seeing in anime that you think that you're going to visit. And I'm like, hell, it wasn't. <laughs> like, I was there. It was fucking awesome. <laughs> you know, like, it was a really great experience. And I was there, like, right at the tail end of, you know, like, 1993 is not that far from the 1980s. There is still a lot of, it, it just was right at the tail end of their economic boom, which is the, the time period where, like, if you watch anime and things like that, anime and manga, it still had references to things from that time period. That's the right. time period that gets represented in the media even today. Like, you see, you see, like, the school outfits 
that they would wear in manga and anime, a lot of those, they don't wear them anymore. They don't wear those, like, idealized, they don't wear those, like, stylized 80s style uniforms. They still wear some of them, but it's just not So, so is it kind of but, like with the 1950s in terms of, like, the American empire at its greatest, the um, American household at its richest, the American yeah. wages at its highest, and that's, like, the golden, viewed as the golden age, at least for the whiter American side. And is it kind of the same thing in Japan with, like, the late 80s, early 90s sort of thing? It really is. It's That's that's a time period that, that people remember extremely fondly because there was an economic boom, everything was going great, people had wonderful lives, and then it just fell into decline, and so it just, it just stands as this time period where everything was going great. And it just gets represented in media that way. And so, I got to experience it with a really wonderful opportunity. So now that I and have so, yeah. the two of you together, for Dylan, do you have any questions for Moon, in, both in terms of SBC or a- anything that, on your mind now that you have like the two of you together? Well, I, I did kind of grill him for three hours with questions uh, a couple of episodes before <laughs> I show. So, I mean, I, I've been on Shiphoster Club for a couple of years now. I believe I joined in 2017. Uh, towards the end of 2017, I really wish I was there sooner because it was everything I wanted in a social media platform, to be honest. Like, I, I only found the Fetty because I was that asshole on Facebook that said, delete your Facebook account, it's spying on you. And everyone's <laughs> like, you're crazy. Or they're like, we know, but there's no alternative. And it's like, uh, one day someone called me on my bluff and I was like, fuck it. I deleted it. Like, I needed a place to go. But I'd already had a footing in the Fetty before I, I did the deletion, right? Like, I had my escape already, and I was just ready to do it. But, like, it's like, what I like about Twitter, and I guess, by extension, Tumblr, right, is that your identity, your profile on this network is just a profile picture, a display name, an addressable handle, a biography, which is probably short, or character limited, and the content of all your posts. Facebook, it has, like, a billion fields Like, you want to give it your favorite quotes? You want to give it your address? It will let you, right? Like, I don't know what it looks like today, but when when I deleted my account in 2018, right? Like, there was a field for everything. Like, you put your phone number in there, you could put all your contact info in there. And it was a bad idea. None of it was required, but a lot of people did it. And it also kind of standardized, like, using your first and last name on the internet. No offense, Jeff. (laughs) <laughs> but like I think that was a mistake I think that was a a, a cultural regret the old people would say that was new and dangerous like, well, don't use your real name well, and they, they shouldn't have kept their like, we're better off being handles and usernames I think than real names you're more free you can have as many identities as you want yeah like yeah. if you like say some inane shit or piss somebody off you can go take a break and start over <laughs> yeah and I know of more than one person who has done that and it's fine. And even if you figure out later who they are, it's fine. I probably wouldn't start over at this point, right? But I also wouldn't really think twice if my family found my online identity, like I was saying earlier before Moon joined. Like, I don't really do anything controversial. Like, I'm not going to, like, lose my job or some shit, right? Because someone wants to go tattle on me about, oh, I use a dangerous website called shitposter.club. Like, if you see the content of my posts, it's mostly just shitposted jokes. Like, I don't even say anything offensive. And it's not that I don't want to say anything offensive. It's because... I just don't post cringe. <laughs> right? And, 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 you, and I, you already, should, you bring happiness to the world through your posts already. Like, I, you've, you've got your I'm fine expressive... I'm people uh, being enabled. Yeah, exactly. People should be enabled to post cringe. I'm just not going <laughs> to... So, from Amun, your side, do you have any questions for Dylan? I know you guys, as mentioned, did have a previous episode of his show, but do you have any questions for him now that you have him on the line? We actually talked for quite a while, even after the podcast, and it was a wonderful, enlightening discussion that I won't share here. But I guess you kind of answered the question that I would have asked, which was, what did you do before Ship Post Club? I guess I would be curious as that, like, how you actually found us, you know, this, that particular server. Mm-hmm. I can answer that. So what happened was, is I was that asshole on Facebook. I discovered that Mastodon exists. Early, early first version of Mastodon, right? There was a 2017 media blitz that Mastodon was this like perfect Twitter that doesn't have any bad people ever, <laughs> right? And then I go check it out. One, it's full of bad people. Two, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Like, I, I looked at article after article penned in 2017 early. This was late 2017, the summer that I signed up, right? Uh, I created an, I tried to create an account on Mastodon.social. Registrations were closed. 
Not sure anymore. But at the time, they were closed forever, air quotes, because decentralization good. Obviously, they went back on that. And so I was like, well, I can't get an account on .social. I don't want some weird domain name. Let's go to another generic one and see what's available. So I went to mastodon.network, spelled out, right? That's a TLD, apparently. Yeah. That server crashed a couple days later, never came back. So I went, I looked for a new one. I was like, okay, mastodon.xyz. This one's actually still up. And I know I made some friends for like a week or two that I was there. I noticed my threads were broken because there was a lot of blocked content that was not disclosed by the admin. And I was like, what the fuck? This is why my threads are broken. I don't, I didn't agree to this, right? And then I found an article that Robeck wrote about, that kind of lays out the history of the Fediverse. And I was like, oh, you know what? This article sounds a lot different than all those glowing praise articles that all those journalists that have ghost accounts wrote. Because a lot of those journalists that praised Mastodon at its inception, they created accounts and they linked their accounts in their articles. They never went back to update their articles and they abandoned their accounts. Like, mm. they, they don't use Mastodon. A lot of those mega servers that throw their weight around, like, hey, we're the main servers of the network. Listen to us. Like, all their accounts are derelict. Like they and, and I think that this is like, people like my, my understanding of Parler is that they're like going through a phase of this right now where the media will talk about them, a whole bunch of people will join, and then conversations start happening, and then wait another week or two, the conversations are all dead, and there's basically no one right. there to interact with in a social level other than the particular individuals who you would expect would be on Parler. Right, the, the right. very, very big, at least attempting to be popular, right-wing pundits, etc. And the same kind of cycle has hit Gab, as I understand it a little bit uh, as well, after they defederated, where like they've gone through these cycles of like a whole bunch of people joining them, probably because Twitter is censoring people, yeah. and then the activity dies down because there isn't a critical mass of people to support it. Gab seems to be right. doing, at least from my vantage point, a little bit more successful than Parler in keeping the consistent level of communication available. But Moon, have you heard, at least uh, in terms of Parler and Gab, uh, anything on that side? Well, it seems like Parler, Parler actually has like big money behind it. It has some uh, uh, right-wing, I don't, I can't remember her name, but she's a big, big right-wing publishing person who would put up money to make Parler. And I just think it's, it's just, as a side note, it's kind of funny where like, I can host almost the same infrastructure as them and it costs me like $64 a month. <laughs> you know, like, like what are they spending all this money on? Holy crap. They but, hey, they, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like there's, there's got to be grip or something going on there. But, I mean, they, they, they advertise and stuff, too. You know, they're trying to get trying to get people on there. But it seems like Harvard are trying to be a more, a more respectable kind of conservative outlet. They, they've got, like you said, the bigger names. Gab has Alex Jones. But, you know, he's kind of, he, even though he's a big name, he's, he's very, very uh, niche, uh, very... Uh, yeah, he didn't really not, not. Uh, post a whole lot. Like, most of his posts, for the brief time that they did Federate, most of his posts were like, hey, we're going live. Hey, thanks for watching. Yeah. Hey, buy my stuff. Like, he didn't, like, reply to people. You know, similar yeah. to, like, the way that you, uh, Dylan, like, you, you mentioned that you have a Twitter account for your podcast, but that's basically all that you post on it. It's just like, hey, we're going right. live, or hey, <laughs> this is the show, right? This, you're not using the network for anything other than maybe, like, re-broadcasting, mm -hmm. right? Right. That is definitely my use case for Twitter. Uh, I do follow a couple things on Twitter that matter to me. Like, my, my show is primarily about video games and tabletop, right? But, like, the... And I described it in one of my podcast episodes. That there's this one game for me and my community at large where, if I were to describe it, it is the wife and not the mistress, right? Like, we always go back. We take breaks, and we'll take long breaks, but we always come back eventually. And that's Planet Side 2. In the brand account, I follow a bunch of Planet Side 2 people. Okay. Because that's just the one game we always keep coming back to. So, Moon, what is the, the wife game for you on that side, rather than the Oh, look, I've made a commitment to the Fediverse. I'm staying, I'm staying very good. <laughs> so that, that's your game uh, to uh, to get on the leaderboard on that one. Yeah. Uh, uh, Shipposter Club does, did kind of have a Twitter account that was used for a while to try to bring people on. What I found was it didn't attract that many people. And I found that I personally misused the account, like a personal account. So finally just discontinued using it. It still exists. It's private. It doesn't do anything. Twitter is too much of a cesspool. And I think yeah. it's, it's kind of funny. I mean, I run a server called shitposter.club. And I'm like, that place is a belt, you know? <laughs> but, but it's so hard to curate your experience and get exactly what you want and not get what you don't want is, is what I found. Like, I, I created an account for work and just followed InfoSec people. And what I found was 
was that almost every InfoSec person primarily posts about politics and then InfoSec. Yeah. So, and following that is just intolerable for me. I can't stand it. It's funny because on the Fediverse, I talk with people that have Mastodon is, is crazy. Those people are insane. Like, they are really, really extreme, even more so than Twitter. But I get along better with them than I do with people on Twitter. What I think is, is that the, even if somebody is really extreme on Mastodon, they're kind of being more true to themselves. They're not just placing clout. On Twitter, everything is amplified and toxified just because you're trying to... Everything is about getting it to go viral and, like, get more reach. And yeah. Also, it, like, it, it's uh, I can interject for a moment. Go for it. Like, uh, one of the things that people on Twitter do a lot is... um the way that they argue is fundamentally different than how they do on the Fediverse because they always project themselves in such a way that plays nice with their algorithm and also allows them to, like, the end goal is usually to get the person you're arguing with banned, right, or their account locked, right? So, for example, my buddy Sarge, co-host of the show, he, um, after the episode we had with you, he started posting on Shipposter Club more, but he got into, like, his first health thread and he, he posted some cringe takes on some stuff, but whatever, I don't give a shit, right? But uh, he was arguing like he was on Twitter. And people were responding to him, and they were just escalating on him to troll him. And normally on Twitter, like, you bait, you troll, you fire back. Eventually someone says something that's too far across the line, you report them and they get banned, or they lock their account because you've shamed them and someone came to your defense. But nobody ever came. Um, <laughs> it doesn't work on the Fediverse because it's decentralized. So the, just the fundamental, like, style and strategy of having an argument on the Internet, or and not just having, like, a heated, like, argument argument but like presenting an argument of a thing on the internet is just fundamentally different on the fediverse because there's no cloud to chase everyone's posts are equal all timelines are chronological right no no post is more important than another post and also like we were talking a little bit before the show started about no agenda social and the no agenda guys mm -hmm. and in terms of like even first like they have quite a few followers in terms of the fediverse like mm -hmm. they, their clout is quite large fediverse clout wise but like if you interact with them they they'll communicate back, right? They they right. there's still this like level of like they're still human beings, and if you ask them something, they'll respond to you because maybe it's just them, you know. Maybe it's they're, they're still small enough that they can handle that, but they seem pretty big, right? And they seem to right. still and maybe this is part of the way the Fediverse is designed in terms of the way the algorithm uh, presents itself being chronological only, basically. Like, do you uh, see that as well on Moon? Well, let me tell you about Mino Agenda. They are a giant self-contained audience that because of Adam Curry decided to join the Fediverse. So they were an existing community that migrated there from Twitter. And a large portion of their community doesn't use doesn't use necessarily even Twitter. They just listen to the radio show and podcast on the internet. And so I actually went to a, a No Agenda a meetup and nobody there used the website. They all just listen to the podcast, but they we, we easily had like 23 people. Now we talk about like Fediverse meetups, and it was like, Fediverse meetup, all right, yeah, you know, like three people met up, or like six people met up, or whatever. And like these guys have got like 23 people meeting up, they don't even use the website. They're just fans of the, they're just fans of the podcast. It's big. They're really big and influential. I, like what you were saying about how they will actually communicate with you. What I have found is, is that they will, is that if you talk to them, they will communicate back. But for the most part, they're interested in talking to each other, which is not bad. It's, yeah, and that makes sense. Uh, like that's, they've got their community there, right? Like that's, that's yes. what they're there for, right? They're, they're yeah. a transplant community and it works really good for them. And I, I think it's great. I really like a lot of the people that are there. Even. Yeah, like if you get these Twitter blue check marks over back on Twitter, like every reply to a post that they make is a risk, a business decision, right? And so a lot of stuff that comes their way, they just won't respond to. Like, they have, like, if you like the wrong post, even, you could get canceled. Yeah, I, I, I was reading somewhere, uh, this was, an, I think, an Instagram thing rather than a Twitter thing. But just, like, to give an example, uh, at least my understanding of it is that the Pope liked some kind of, like, Brazilian lingerie models picture or something. Oh. Which, I mean, it, it, he's a single guy who has nothing but time on his hands. Of course he's going to find pictures of Brazilian beautiful women to occupy his time but i'm sure the the catholic church now that this is a public thing at least allegedly it's business-esque risk that has been taken right. and like that sort of thing 
does happen on Twitter like clockwork. This is the just the most recent example of it. But like, does anyone care what gets liked on the Fediverse? Like, right? There's the people Nobody who get liked. I mean, I look at what who likes my posts because they make me feel good, yeah. right? But like, Mister Mister Pope, if you're listening to this, sign up today at shitposter.club. Follow all of my bots. They post porn all the time, and you'll have a great time. I promise. No one has to know. <laughs> and he could even be at Pontifex at Shipposter Club and nobody would believe it's him. <laughs> it's not taking uh, yeah. yeah, we've got people, we've got Catholics, we've got, there's a guy who, um, I, I, I'm not sure what he is, but he, parse, he, he posts stuff on the, on the Farsi Bible, he speaks like, like, uh, like Farsi, he's learning it, so he, he posts about it on the site. <laughs> like, we have a, the one thing that might backfire on us with regards to getting the Pope on there is that I've already established that there were only two there are only two political positions that Shit Poster Club has. There are only two. And the first one is that race mixing is great. And the second one is, get no reason for that. Now it's because it drove certain people crazy. So you just, all you have to do, all you have to do to keep certain people from signing up is say, I love race mixing. It, it works it, like that. It's magic. so easy. I yeah. actually, uh, I didn't say that, but I, I made a point about that in my last podcast episode that released yesterday, but I was kind of drunk when we recorded that. I was trying to get a point across that, that there are people that post cringe and I normally don't reply to it. And I, I gave like a really poorly delivered an example. Uh, but I was, I was also talking about like stuff like that. Like you'd be surprised at how many like cringy edge posters will avoid you if you just say one thing or another that does not align with their beliefs. God, I had one guy reply to me and Robeck the other day. Like, Robeck replied to one of my Doom memes with a picture of Pepe the Frog wearing Doom Guy's helmet from Doom 2016. And he went, like, on an essay-length rant about why Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal is bad, Microsoft bad, Bethesda bad, id Software should never have been bought out. And he, like, went, and he felt like he was personally attacked by the fact that we weren't agreeing with him. Like, yeah, fuck new Doom. Every Doom game is different. Even the Plutonia experiment, which was the worst one. But uh, this dude, like, he was, like, frothing at the mouth almost. And I'm like, why am I replying to him? This is a mistake. But I didn't even say anything that controversial. It's just the fact that I wouldn't immediately say, yeah, fuck the new Doom games. He was like, <laughs> I was, like, expecting him to demand that I change my profile picture at some point uh, from Spinning Cactus Demon. Like, how dare you? Like, this is a lot of things. For, for Doom fans, I don't know. Like, this dude was off his fucking meds, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the the other political position that we have is that we are officially synodicitous, which means that we believe that the last pope was a uh, Pope Pius the uh, was it the eighth. <laughs> um, so it was basically the, the the last legitimate pope was in the 1950s, and every pope since then has been an imposter, and the throne has been has been vacant. So Moon, speaking of imposter popes, so from given that you guys actually are both on the, the U.S. side, who, who is the the next president of the United States going to be? Are we going to have two presidents, or is it going to be like <laughs> one president, or? <laughs> no, I. I... This is really ridiculous. Uh, this, this whole thing is ridiculous. I don't see it. Yet. I'm going to avoid going too much into the political angle of it. But but yeah, it's like he's, this is the opposite of like leaving the throne empty. It's like he won't leave. <laughs> right. So there's all these allegations of voter fraud. And uh, there's lots of people posting what is supposedly anecdotal evidence. Like I've seen TikToks and Snapchats of like ballot workers ripping up Trump ballots, dumpsters full being lit on fire. They could be fake. And there's definitely some fraud, but I don't think there, I personally don't think there was enough fraud to flip the election. But r regardless so, of whether there was fraud or not, right? Like <laughs> you can take for granted that, that there was or there wasn't, but like regardless right. which one, which candidate is the next candidate that is going to be the president? Will it be Trump? Will there be two? Will it just be the one? Or is it going to depend gonna be, on these fraud cases? It's going to be Kanye. You guys can see. <laughs> Kanye is going to come through and he's going to be our new pope. <laughs> I mean president. <laughs> I, I've, got, a combo. I've got one Q-tard on the server, there's one guy who follows Q, and he is absolutely, positively insistent that Trump is ready for this, and he's just going to fly out of the wings and and grasp the presidency again, like clip it free from Joe Biden, and that these lawsuits are going to pay off. When Biden got initially clear that the Biden was probably the winner, uh, we changed our banner, and I made the banner that said, uh, uh, Trust the plan. Trust the plan. Trust the plan. <laughs> Yeah. Which, and which, by the way, guys. people listening, I mean, there is more than one plan in the world. So regardless of how the outcome of this election goes. I was a cue saying, like, you're supposed to trust the plan. But like, it was like obvious that Trump had not, had not. Right. But he still insists. He still swears. Like, he's, 
And he's posting, he does not sound desperate. He sounds like he really thinks he's going to win. He is it's just sure. weird. Like, I don't get it. Like, I fully support this this dude's right to, like, do the lawsuits and, and ask for recounts. But the lawsuits are getting thrown out because they're bullshit. Right? Like, if you yeah. had evidence, he should have presented it by now. <laughs> Sounds like they, they ain't got none. But I encourage him to try because this is right. But so, Jeff, you're from Canada. You probably don't have all the, the awareness. But uh, there's other interesting things about the election that no one likes to talk about because it's not the presidency. But uh, one thing that is of note is that there's a lot of people that voted more than ever, right? Yeah. Like, Joe Biden has the most record votes of any president in history, and Trump has the second most votes of any pres- candidate in history. So, like, they got first and second world records, I guess, for our. Uh, world records, I say, as it's for just our country, right? (laughs) But what's interesting is that a lot of people turned out to vote, but a lot of them only voted for president because the the Democrats have lost. So we have two bodies of government in in the United States. We have like the House of Representatives, which is a population state-based number of people. So if you have a really populous state, you'll have a lot of House representatives because it's um, it's supposed to represent little slices of your state based on how many people live there. Mm -hmm. And then every state gets two senators, no matter how big or small it is, right? Which is kind of undemocratic if you think about it too hard, but that's not a big deal. That, that's a story so, for another time. <laughs> that's a story for another day. Yeah. So the Democrats have lost seats in the House in total, and they didn't flip anything below the House, because there's a lot of, like, district spots, right? And they didn't flip a single seat, and they only lost or kept what they had. So every 10 years, the districts on the maps are redrawn. So Republicans and the right-wingers in general are in a unique position where they get to, for the next 10 years, say where all the boundaries are for the districts, which will allow them to gerrymander themselves into a position where they will probably take the House in the midterm election. So the second half of what should be Joe Biden's presidency, they will probably have a Republican-controlled House of Representatives, and if they don't get their shit together, they're probably going to have a Republican-controlled Senate the whole time. Because we were still waiting for a runoff election. So in some states, like Georgia, when it's too close, they do another election. Right. But there's, there's some rules behind who's allowed to vote in it. Like, you can't move there today and vote in it, right? Like, it's the people that are already there. Okay. It, it's more complicated than that. So the result of that election will decide if the Senate is 50-50 red and blue or if it's red control. Right. On a tie vote, the vice president gets to vote, the tiebreaker. And it, so if Joe Biden wins, Kamala Harris will break all ties. So okay. they need 51 seats of red. And we don't know if they're going to have that or not until this runoff election next month is done. So... Joe Biden might be a, a blue president that gets nothing done, and then he set up for some pretty serious failure in midterm elections with how the boundaries get redrawn. That they, they took a pretty bit, other than beating Trump, which is like beating a corpse, I guess. And they're both kind of corpses, right? They're both kind of like old, one one foot in the grave, <laughs> right? Both of them. They're both kind of senile to me. In terms of everything else that mattered this election, the left wingers they took a pretty big L, right? So they're in trouble if they don't step it up and get their shit together. Like they need to start that whole. That's why they're starting to say unity and shit now because they're kind of desperate. Because yeah, they're not going to do a whole lot. Go ahead. They won the presidency, but they didn't get that mandate that they thought that they were going to have against Trumpism. So they're right. kind of yeah, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge for them. So yeah, they're and, setting them up for ten more years of heavy conservatism in terms of the gerrymandering of the state level. So, yeah, and I mean Trump got appointed a Supreme Court justice. Oh yeah, you're kidding, you, Jeff. You may not know that Supreme Court Supreme Court justices are appointed for life because they're supposed to be impartial, right? They're not supposed to be for a party. But so in, in practice, by not though. having to win re-election, they don't have to appease anybody. Yeah, because they're there for life. So. I mean, they have leanings, turns out, right? I mean, welcome to the modern era. But, like, that's why they're appointed for life. And Trump appointed the last fucking three of them. One of them was Big News, but there's two others. (laughs) Yeah, so, like, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. And literally her dying wish was do not appoint a Supreme Court justice (laughs) until Trump is out of office. Now, what I loved about this was that that, that, that's basically like your enemy saying, like... Whatever Whatever you do, don't send the torpedo down this particular part of the Death Star. Yeah, exactly. Whatever you do. Like, like Democrats are, like, appealing to Republicans, like, like, oh, it was our dying wish, you have to, like, honor this. And it's like, like, we're supposed to honor a wish to fuck us. (laughs) It's like, please, 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 please. Yeah. that's your dying wish, here's the gun, come on. Like, I, I guess like, that's the reason why I, yeah, I guess the reason why I bring it up is that, that she was, I mean, like you said, all, all judges have their biases. She was uh, mm-hmm. very 
open about what she believed and why she voted a certain way. But maybe they, they all do their dissents and their, their justifications, their, their right papers, you know, them. but she was very, very explicit, like doing, she, she went a step further and did like talks and went to places, was like, you know, paid to do speeches and things. And um, yeah, so I'm not making a statement about who I think, you know, would have been a great replacement for a Supreme Court justice, but but uh, it was it was contentious and when she was when when she vacated that spot, it was very obvious that they were the Republicans were going to have to tell somebody that right. yeah. So they were gonna it, it, that in out. the meanwhile though the, we we are getting I, close can I say, to the, can I say one more thing okay, before, go for it. before we move on. So well to be clear, I both I think both you know Trump and Biden are, are fucking senile lizard people. But what's interesting <laughs> is that with the appointment with with Rupert Kinsler's death and the appointing of the new girl, there's actually a Catholic, a practicing Catholic majority on the Supreme Court. There's always been predominantly Catholic, at least in terms of religious. That, like, have we even had a Protestant? I'm not sure. <laughs> like, I'm not sure. Like, if they're religious, they're always, almost always Catholic. It's been very unusual that the court has been, the court has been, if they were religious, they were either Catholic or Jewish. So all the more reason for the Pope to sign up on shitposter.club so he can hear our political takes and he can influence the court. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> and look at hot Brazilian girls. <laughs> Which, I mean, so you've already got bought. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, but we are getting to late into the show here. So from Moon, is there anything you'd like to get through to the world now that you have the world's attention yet again? Uh, I would say prepare for doomsday because things are getting bad out there. I would invest in uh, canned food and shotguns. Canned food and shotguns. Good advice. And of course, uh, wear body armor as well, I would add to that. But, uh, and for Dylan, is there any last words now that you have the world's attention that you'd like to get through to the world? Well, I mean, yeah, preparing for the worst would be a good idea, especially if you live in cities because it's already been kind of the worst it's ever been for them uh, in recent memory. I'd like to reiterate that the small town living and the small town life, like, it's still pretty good here. Like, you should still prepare and buy canned food and shit because the global or the, the national infrastructure with like truck driving and shit is kind of fragile, right? But I don't think life is as bad as people make it out to be. I really don't. Like, I, there's a lot to look forward to, I think. But if you don't live in a city, if you live in a city, yeah, go buy a shop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank you both Moon and Dylan for participating this week. And just as a reminder, Moon, it does run shitposter.club, so you can go there and sign up to the Fediverse. And yeah, Dylan, we're both there. Dylan and I are both there. Right. And Dylan, you have your podcast, which I will link to in any thread where this video is posted. And uh, for the rest of you, uh, there is subscribestar.com slash Jeff Dashcliff or Jeff Stroke Cliff for those of you who use that terminology to support this particular show. And so with that, I will end uh, for the week on, and we will see you all next week.